Thank you. It's, it's always a pleasure to be with my colleague. We, we share a lot of interest in the same issues, um, whether it's issues within the Senate or just uh, personal. I think we both really care and love the outdoors. Uh, I, I joke with him about the skiing, though. I do take my skiing seriously. And uh, Mark doesn't know, but we've got yet another connection. Our sons, my sons are 18 and 20. I have one that has been with you in Boulder, at University of Colorado Boulder, for the past two years. And my younger son has decided that he is also going to school in Colorado. He's going to be out in Gunnison has nothing to do with the education there. It has everything to do with the quality of your mountains. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm hoping that the academics can actually slip in there uh, when, <laughs> when the skiing is not so good. But uh, this, is, this is a struggle for uh, a parent. Um, they've been back here in Washington, D.C. for their high school years. And as they say, Mom, you took us away from the mountains. So when it comes to college, we're picking and we're basing it on, on uh, the wonderful environment that you have back there. So thank you for taking care of my children. <laughs> With that said, uh, thank you for, for letting me join you for just a few minutes. I, I am Sorry that I'm late. I just came from a, from a round table with the, the Swedish ambassador and the Danish ambassador, and we're talking about the Arctic. And to those of you in Colorado, welcome to the fact that you are part of an Arctic nation. You might not think about that when you are in Colorado with the, with the ocean uh, th hundreds, thousands of miles away from you, but we are an Arctic nation. And as such, we have certain responsibilities, and I'm always glad to remind uh, Americans uh, of our role in the Arctic and, and what it means to us as a nation. Uh, in addition to, to focusing on the Arctic, I spend a lot of time and a lot of energy focusing on energy. Alaska is, is an energy producing state, as is Colorado. Uh, we've been supplying uh, a good portion of our nation's domestic oil uh, in this country for the past 30 years coming out of Prudhoe Bay. We've got great opportunity to continue to do so. We've run into some roadblocks, uh, primarily permitting roadblocks to access additional oil resource from the north. We will continue to do that because I believe when we talk about an energy policy, it really does have to be an all of the above policy. We must do more to produce domestically in this country. And I believe that's oil. I believe that's natural gas. I believe that's, that's coal that is, is, is produced and, and uh, produces energy cleanly. Um, but producing domestically also includes a move towards our renewable energy resources. And as much as Alaska is a producing state from fossil fuels, we think that we can also be the national leader in renewable energy resources as well. Right now, 25% of our energy in the state of Alaska comes from hydropower. We want more to be coming from hydropower. And it's small hydropower. It's lake tap. We don't, we don't disturb the fisheries. There is no impact, uh, real, no, no, uh, uh, no impact to the fisheries, to, to really the surrounding area and how we have built out our hydro capacity. But we've also got everything else that you can possibly imagine. We got 33,000 miles of coastline. That's a lot of coastline. And so with that, what are we doing? How are we tapping in that energy potential? Well, really, right now, we're not. And yet, there's nothing more reliable, nothing more reliable than what happens with the tides. Think about how we harness that. Think about how we can harness the, 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 the energy from, from our huge, massive rivers like the Yukon and the Kuskokwim. Think about how we can tap into just the strength of our, of our oceans with, with marine hydrokinetic energy. We've got geothermal potential that you can't even believe. You look at the, the Aleutian chain, it's just one string of volcanoes with just bubbling energy waiting to be tapped into. But our biggest problem is what? We are way too far from anybody else. And that's more than just a little bit of a challenge. But that's what gets us up any morning, every morning. Less than 700,000 people 
in the state of Alaska. 80% of our communities are not connected by road. Think about what that means to a community. How do you get your fuel in? How do you get your goods in? We fly them in. We put them on a barge. Think about that. You put them on a barge. How often do you have a barge come to your village? Twice a year if you're lucky. Think about that from a planning perspective, all you mothers who shop at Costco. I mean, holy smokes. So it's a, it's a different way of, of operating up there that I think forces us to be a little more independent, a little more creative. We do a lot of thinking outside the box in Alaska when it comes to how we live, how we utilize our resources, how we care for our environment. And, and that's a good challenge for us. OK, I got to stop because I can talk to you all morning long and just rattle. What, what would you like to know, whether it's about Alaska, whether it's about what's happening with our energy potential in this nation? Thank you. In fact, we, we have just introduced and, and moved through the Energy Committee mm, 10 days or so ago uh, uh, three hydro bills that, um, that really attempt to put hydro on the same footing as other renewable energy sources when it comes to our, our, the tax credits and the policies that are out there. We have a, a, we have a way here in the Senate, or not in the Senate, in the Congress, of picking winners and losers when it comes to what renewable energy um, will, will gain favor and, and gain access to, to whether it's tax credits or, or whatever the policy may be. Um, that's, that can be good if we pick the right winners, but when we miss the mark, then where are we? We're having a big debate right now over ethanol and whether we perhaps went too far in providing subsidies for ethanol. We picked what we thought was a winner and maybe not so much anymore. So what we're trying to do with, with more of our, our renewable energy sources is to, to level out that playing field. And I think it's going to be critical with, with hydro. Again, we've, we have advanced that. Um, one of the other things that we are looking at from an energy committee perspective is not so much you know, how we fashion tax credits for geothermal or, or, or hydro or wind or whatever, how we can really focus on, on moving to this next generation of, of, of energy. Uh, part of that equation has got to be using less of what we're currently consuming. And that is so overlooked. The efficiency, the conservation end of things is just so overlooked. And I think partly because it's not revolutionary. It's not some hot shot technology that somebody's come up with that's kind of a gee whiz. It's just being smarter about how we use our resources. So focusing on the consume less, use less, part of the bumper sticker, produce more, use less, is, is what I say, um, is, is something that we might think is, is, is pretty automatic, but it's not. So we're doing a lot more in the committee on that. Uh, we're working aggressively to how we can uh, move off of uh, foreign sources of oil. You know, how do we do that? Well, let's, uh, let's figure out a different way to move ourselves around. Uh, Electric vehicles, you know, we've, we've got a couple different bills in the committee that we're, we're considering right now. Uh, natural gas for our fleet vehicles. These are all things that, again, make sense in, in moving us towards not only energy independence, but allowing us to be in a position where we really can be producing more for ourselves, becoming more energy independent and reducing the vulnerabilities uh, that we have as a nation. I understand the goal is to move forward and everybody's goal is to move away from oil, but does anybody consider the economic viability of this? Um, 
Um, your your observation about throwing things against the wall and seeing what happens, I, I have suggested that we don't have an energy policy in this country. We have, a, we have policy by default, and that's not a way to operate. This is not something that we should have. Look at what China is doing. They've got a policy that says if we want to have the, the energy and the resources that we need for us as a nation. And if we don't have them here, not only are we going to buy up the resource, but we're going to buy up the transportation systems from start to finish to get us where we need to get. They've got a policy that is clearly defined. Ours is not. Ours, I believe, is a policy by default. I don't think that that works. I don't think that it is efficient for us. I think it costs us boatloads of dollars. Nuclear, absolutely has to be part of, of our energy portfolio in a strong and aggressive way. We all watched with horror what happened in Japan. But I think we need to recognize that we have the ability to, to, to work to reduce the risks that are associated with energy production, whether it's, whether it's nuclear, whether it's, it's, it's natural gas, whatever it is. So let's figure out how we deal with, with the issues that are associated. Right now, we've, we've got a little bit of a waste problem with, with nuclear, and it has not been made any, uh, any better by what's going on with, with Yucca Mountain and, and basically taking that repository off the table. But I believe that nuclear must advance in a far more aggressive manner than we have allowed it to historically. We just kind of came out of that, that period where nothing was happening for 25, 30 years. And uh, we're starting to move forward. And, and, and then the, the disaster in, in Japan. We cannot let that de derail us. There's a question up here. We need more. <laughs> Plain and simple. We need more women in, in politics, certainly more women in the Senate. We're at 17 percent here in the Senate, uh, not an enviable number. And uh, it's not any better in the House. Um, we look at, at other nations around the world and, and as they're putting together their governments and, and uh, policies. And, and the goal there is to have 25 percent of, of their elected body female. And they're actually achieving it. And we're encouraging that. And we're still sitting here at 17% and saying that's good. It's not good. There is a different dynamic. And this is, this is no reflection on my male colleagues. It's just that men and women um, oftentimes operate just a little bit different. And uh, uh, I think it's important that in a nation where it's about 50-50, in terms of what the makeup of the population is, if this is truly going to be representative, then we need to have more women in elective bodies. We need to have more minorities uh, within our elective bodies. We need to do a better job of that. We need to do a better job recruiting women. Um, can't be afraid to take a risk. You know? And sometimes I think that, uh, that women hesitate to step forward um, for whatever reason. It's not the right time. The kids are too little. The kids are too big. Uh, there's never going to be a convenient time to be in public office. And you just have to accept that and recognize that your life is going to be a little bit different uh, and, and take that risk and move. But I am, I am one who takes every opportunity that I can to encourage women, and particularly young women, to run for elective office. We have all kinds of groups that come to Washington, DC. And I will make time out of my day to go speak to, to the young women. Uh, the young female leaders and encourage them in this effort. It's, uh, it's just too important. I've got time for about one more. I'll, I'll go on this side. Um, you were talking about the all of the above options. And of course, in Alaska with MR um, and the Gulf disaster, uh, people just like they put nuclear under the microscope yep. again, of course, oil. But obviously, the all of the above needs that solution. Uh, what do you think can be done? 
make that work effectively? It, it, it's an important question because in Alaska we have been uh, we've been put somewhat off off limits um, to accessing resources within our own state. Unlike most other states, um, you know, we're, we're sitting here, the federal uh, government is, is our landlord of about 60% of our lands, about 1%, 1% of our lands are in, st in private lands. Um, and so <clears throat> we're kind of under the microscope for what we do. But we happen to think that under that microscope, we've performed pretty well. 30 years we've been producing from Prudhoe Bay. And we have a very, very, very strong record of, of, of safety and, and good, strong production. Unfortunately, what most people think of when they think about Alaskan oil is they think about the Exxon Valdez. And that was a horrible, terrible environmental tragedy. 20 years ago, we are still living with the aftermath of that. Alaskans do not forget that, and they will not accept anything that might ever get us close to that level of risk again. What we've done, we were the ones. We led as a state in demanding that any tanker that comes in that would be carrying crude has to be a doubled hull tanker. We demanded as a state, not the federal government coming in, that there were going to be escorts, a tug escorts, all the way out Prince William Sound because we were not going to run the risk of, of a, a, a stupid mistake uh, as we saw back in... Uh, in, in uh, in Prince William Sound. So where do we go from here? We have a mean, mean estimate in Anwar is, is about 16 billion barrels of oil. Offshore in the Beaufort and Chukchi, estimates 27 billion barrels. In the National Petroleum Reserve, Alaska, designated for exploration and access to meet our national security needs. Uh, you know, reserves all around, and yet we've been, we have been held back. Um, in Anwar, it's been historic, 25 years we've been fighting to open it. We're trying to get permission to go offshore, uh, but five years and four billion dollars almost later, we still don't have the permits to move forward. National Petroleum Reserve, we're being shut down because the EPA has not issued uh, a permit to build a bridge over a river to access the area where the oil companies want to go in and explore. I happen to believe that in, in uh, an honest and open appraisal about what it is that we need as a nation, what it is that Alaska is willing and able to provide that we will be able to advance offshore. We will be able to do more aggressively within the NPRA. And ultimately, we will be able to access those resources within ANWR. Keep in mind with ANWR, what we're talking about is an area that has been designated by, by law to be an area for exploration. What, what what we're talking about, though, is not within the wilderness area. It's not within the refuge area. It is an area that has been literally cordoned off at the top of the state for exploration and development. And yet, even with that reserve, we have not been able to access it. We're looking to access about 2,000 acres maximum uh, to, to, to tap into the oil resource there. We think that we can do the job. We know that we've been doing it for 30 plus years, and we know that we have been doing it in a manner that is consistent with the environmental stewardship that Alaskans expect. I'm hopeful that the rest of the country will gain the advantage of this resource that we want to be able to provide. I'm going to have to get over to the House. I'm testifying on a, on a bill over there that relates to Alaska, so I appreciate the time, but we've got, uh, we've got uh, my colleague from the state who's standing in reserve ready to answer other questions that you have about the state of Alaska. So thank you for your attention this morning.